Alright, this particular increment is going to cover some pronunciation and other things about the language that are characteristic of New Testament uh, writing, but they don't get much attention from scholars today. Uh, they used to get a lot of attention, and I think they still should. So we're going to cover some of these things. The, the primary topics of this video are going to be how Atticisms and he Hebraisms are used throughout the New Testament and in the 1930s, 1950s, scholars really paid a lot of attention to it. In late late 1980, uh, 1880s too they did. But modern scholarship tends to lump everything as some, you know, monolithic Koine language which frankly never existed. Koine has never been pure. Okay, it's always been loaded with Greek Atticisms because that comes from drama, which was very popular in those days. And it's always been loaded with Hebraisms because everybody learned the LXX. And that was a 300 year old translation that had greatly affected not only the Jewish use of words in Greek, but it affected everybody's use of words in Greek in that area. And then along came, you know, the Romans and Latinisms and the Latin ideas got morphed into the Greek language so that there are Latinisms in Greek. Okay? In other words, the way the Greek language was used at the time the Bible was written in Greek, whether Old Testament or New, was greatly impacted by the cultures of the people who spoke the words. And so when they spoke the words, when they used the words, they used ideas they borrowed just like we do in English or any other language on earth. You borrow from the, the cultures you're around, all right? And if you don't know that and you don't pay enough attention to it, then you're going to misread the Bible, okay? Even if you can read Greek, you're going to misread it. And modern scholars have just sort of thrown all that evidence out, and they make really bad mistakes when they do that. Okay, so we start up here, Kaipin Mariam. Um, there's no big, you know, no big deal there, except that uh, Mary is Miriam in Hebrew. So Mariam is a transliteration in Greek of a Hebrew word. See, there's your first Hebraism. Okay, megalun nehesuki. Okay, megalun nehesukemu tonkurion. That's how you could say it, or you could say megalun nehesukimu tonkurion. You notice that I changed the accent. Is it suke or suke? I submitted suke. This, and I, I keep saying this, and a, a lot of scholars know this, in Greek these are not um, stress accents, they're pitch accents. They're like tones in, in Mandarin Chinese. You're supposed to raise your voice or lower your voice. Where you see this, this apostrophe sort of like, it means that you're supposed to be saying the A sound, and it's an A sound, not an E sound. You're supposed to be saying it in the upper part of your palate. All right, I'm not doing it right right now because I'm speaking in English and Greek. If I just read it only in Greek, I'd do a better job. But this is not suke, it's suke. All right? Megalune suke mu. See? Megalune suke mu. And you say lune, and this, this one does get a stress because the rules of Greek pronunciation were that you stress the penultimate accent. That, that enabled better flow. All right, and it's megaluno. See, and that's the other thing I want to stress here, is that when you're using words that have case-ending changes, that doesn't change the stress on the stem. If you change the stress on the stem to some other syllable, then you render the word in um, un unhearable. If you say megalune his mu tonkurion, okay. You're gonna you're gonna mess it up for the people who are listening to you. You have to make sure that your stress stays somewhat loyal to the um, the root of the word. All right, and and sometimes you have to switch the stress because of the combinations of words that you're using. 
but it's megalune. You don't, you're not going to change this. So they, they accented it right there. You know, the ancient Greeks didn't use accents. There was a revival, there was a partial use of them. Um, I want to say around 200 BC. But even in ancient Greek and Attic times, they didn't use that. They didn't. They didn't write the accents down. So all of these accent marks you see are estimates by later people about how the words were said. So you know, sometimes you just have to ignore it. Okay, megalune su kemu. See how much better that sounds. Megalune su kemu. Ton kurion. Okay, ton kurion is how I should have said it. Megalune su kemu. See how that flows? Megalone su kemoton kurion. And so <clears throat> because it's kurias. That's the vocabulary form. So you keep it. Ton kurion. And they did, you know, they did stress it right there. So you can see they did it right there and there, but this is wrong. You'd be raising your voice, but you wouldn't be stressing that syllable. Megalone su kemoton kurion. See how, how well that works? I mean, even with my, with my American, you know, Americanized Greek, that has flow. It sounds, it sounds euphonious, all right? And you'll notice that I'm using the old pronunciation, which is not Erasmus. It's classical Greek, all right? It's neither Erasmus nor the modern garbage that they're peddling now, where they turn all the vowels into I sounds. That's a bunch of baloney. <clears throat> the modern Greeks have, are, are lazy speakers compared to the ancients. And we, you know, we, our, our modern English is lazy too. See how that pronunciation works? It has, it has a cadence, it has a beat to it. All right, and that's going to matter a lot because cause when she gets down here, it's hotepe blepsin. See, stresses on blep, not on epe. The stress is not there. Hotepe blepsin. See, because it's blepo. The verb is blepo. All right, so you're going to keep you, you're going to you're going to keep your your stress there. Hotepe blepsin. Because if you say hotepe blepsin, first of all, it makes your tongue get all tied up. Secondly, you don't know what kind of verb they're talking about if you're saying it fast. Hotepe blepsin. Epitentapenosin. See how much better that sounds? See, it's got cadence. Alright, so that, that's the next thing I wanted to do, is just, just show this business about <clears throat> you stress the stem. If you're going to stress, you stress the stem so that the integrity of the verb is maintained. And then these are, and I can't do this right. Your voice is supposed to go up when you see a, a pitch accent with a, a rising apostrophe. And then this, when it's going down, that's like fourth tone in Mandarin. Dang. Okay? Your voice is going down at the end of the eta. Okay? Epe. Dang. All right? And then the next thing I wanted to cover, because I've been making this mistake, because I learned it wrong. This word here is not ice. It's ace. That's classical Attic Greek pronunciation, and that's the way it should be said. Ace. Okay, this is Kai. See, your voice ends at the end. It's going down. Kai. And this is ice. It's much more elegant. And it's actually correct. See, because the ancient pronunciation is, this is always, all vowels in ancient pronunciation of any language are short. Long vowels came about due to diphthongs. People invented diphthongs in order to create I. AI. And if you wanted to say A, you, you combined it so that you had EI. A E. I. 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 See how it turns into a long A? I. A. E. I. 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 See? So it's ice. And the S at the end has a little bit of a sh sound on it. It's not an SH, and it's not really an S, and it's not really a hiss. It's, it's, it's a softening. It's a softened S. And it's kind of like the S in um, Castilian. 
That's the closest I can I can think of to it. And modern Greeks still pronounce it that way today. I've, I've heard them. That's how I, I learned this. Okay. So it's ice. You sort of really soft though. Very, very soft and nice sounding. Again, like the Castilian ass. Castilian Spanish. <clears throat> okay. You know, Sp Spanish in Spain versus Spanish in other countries. All right, so now we've covered we've covered stress and pitch accents. Um, we've covered that this is a down voice and that this is um, blah, blah, blah. What was the up, the up sound where you're saying it in the upper part of your palate? Here, you're saying it in the upper part of your palate. Here, you're coming down and you're saying this really on your tongue at the it's going down. It's in the down in the back of your throat almost, okay. And then we talked about how you preserve the the stress on the root of the word, the root of the vocabulary form. So this is epiblepsin, hot epiblepsin. The the accent, if you're going to stress it, is going to be here, penultimate syllable, generally speaking, okay. Kurion, because it's kurias in the vocabulary form. Ragaliasen, and this is a ya sound. That later changes. It doesn't stay. It, the, 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 the I A becomes a ya, but it, it, it changes over time. It's not constantly this way. I haven't figured out the rules for that yet. Because you can see, like when Paul uses it, sometimes he says ia. And I am, I'm not sure why. Sometimes it's ia, sometimes it's ya. Okay? And again, long vowels are formed as diphthongs because the original vowel sounds in all languages known to man from the beginning of time, the original version, the earliest version of that language was short vowels. A, E, I, so it's kite, not, not K. The A sound is here. A, E, 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 It's really E. Just try to say E, E, fast, and you'll get the right sound. I have to practice this myself, okay? I'm just, I just know what the rules are. Knowing them and, you know, living up to them are two different things. All right. <clears throat> so I've covered those pronunciation issues. Now I want to get to um, the way she's using words. Okay, this is, this is Luke, so that these syllables out here are all due to Luke's addition. And he's making a little commentary on her poem by means of doing that because he knows the reader is going to have to tally up the syllables based on his addition. See, because this, this functions as a title. Then Mary said, they would locate it by those words. You know, when they, because they memorize scripture orally, so they'd, they'd locate the first couple of words of any passage of scripture. You memorize those specially. So then you would remember the rest of them. That's how I memorized Isaiah 53 also. It's really easy to remember if you just memorize the first couple of syllables uh, where it starts. So he's giving you a start point when he says this. And so therefore your syllable counts all go up by four. And he's making little, little plays on um, the meter in history when he does this. But that's another story. All right. Megalu nesu kimoton kurion. Concurion. I keep saying that wrong. All right. These, this is a Bible passage she's quoting. Many Bible passages, especially in Psalms. All right. This is straightforward, you know, my, you know, typical average Greek stuff. Except it's a Hebraism because she's using, she's, use, she's quoting scripture. And again, like I said before, megalune means to magnify by means of, of multiplying. It's used for produce, okay? The idea of being glorified by having much, okay? So you're glorifying the Lord by producing, and she's making fun of the fact that she's pregnant, so the Lord is going to be multiplied because once he, you know, finishes the cross, his thinking is going to be multiplied in us, okay? And Paul picks up on that in Philippians 1.20. Paul picks up on Mary. I'm, this is the biggest surprise to me. Okay, is how Paul keeps picking up on Mary. I never, I, I would have never dreamed it. You know, I, this is what I get for listening to the scholars. They all say that Paul was a misogynist, la, 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 la. Baloney. 
This guy was hung up on pregnancy. He's the only virgin apostle, and that's all he ever talks about is pregnancy in his letters. Well, he's getting it from Mary <laughs> because that's what she's talking about right here. So he's using her keyword in Philippians 1.20. Okay? It's really hysterical. I remember when my pastor covered that verse, how he spent his, his time explaining that this is a pregnancy word, and it is. <clears throat> okay, so that's what she's doing there. So again, you know, it's straightforward Greek, but it's a Hebraism because this is this this here she's quoting from the Old Testament, especially the Psalms. Okay, and Kagalia sentonu mamu, Kagalia sentonu mamu. Okay, see, it's numa, not numa. Kagalia sentonu numamu. Okay. I can't, the ah is supposed to be set high in the throat. I have to figure out how to do that. It's been years since I've studied Mandarin, so I've lost my tone. Okay. But you're supposed to use the high tone. You know, this is the um, Mandarin ni, ni hama. Excuse me for speaking it badly. Okay, the ni means you in Mandarin Chinese. That That's an upper, that's an upper tone. But when you say ni by itself, it's ni. And that's third tone in Mandarin which Greek doesn't have. So it's like second tone in Mandarin. If you speak Mandarin, just remember that's how you're supposed to say that A there. All right? And then this is like fourth tone in Mandarin, Kai. Ma, 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 ma. Okay, sorry about my bad print. I haven't spoken Mandarin in over 30 years. So there you go. All right? This too is a Hebraism, hello. My soul rejoices. <clears throat> That's all over the Old Testament, especially in Psalms. She's talking like David, because she's a daughter of David. You got that? So it's a Hebraism. All right, so you have to go look up all the verses that say rejoice. You have to go look up all the words that say exalt. Okay, and there are like 16 different Hebrew words for exalt. You know, there's Nisa, there's Gadol, there's uh, what? <clears throat> um... Yarum, that's in Isaiah 52:13. Hina, Yaskil Avdi Yarum, okay, that's Isaiah 52:13 in my bad Hebrew, right? See, I can say what the rules are, but that doesn't mean I can obey them. <laughs> Woo. Okay, this is straightforward Koine Greek here. Epi toi teoi, and you're supposed to go. T -t -t -t. You you say you you put your tongue in the back of your teeth. And you use you aspirate, tch, tch. but you don't do it rudely. It's it, epitoi teoi, see, epitoi teoi toi soterimu. That's how she's saying it. That's her cadence. <clears throat> epitoi teoi, and then you pause. Toi soterimu, because if you say epitoi teoi toi, you're gonna you're gonna lose your you're gonna with your tongue. Epitoi teoi, pause. Toi soterimu. Epitoi teoi toi soterimu. See how well that works? And this epi is, is, is I gotta cover this. This is this is now we we covered Hebraisms. Now we're coming on well it's not even earlier than Atticisms. This is Ionic Dative. You ever heard of that? Probably not, but the scholars have. This is what Paul uses in Ephesians two ten. My life was never the same the day that I heard my pastor exegete that fact in Ephesians 2.10. I wrote a whole web page on this about the epic ionic dative in Ephesians 2.10. If you want the web page, just ask me and I'll tell you. See, that's why I translated it, found it. The ionic dative means dative of purpose. You found something on something else like a city, on the ground. In order to do something, in order to make something out of what you founded. Now, do you get this? When somebody is founding something on somebody else or something else, it's the one who's doing the founding that's doing the work. So when it says in Ephesians 2.10, which I bet money Paul is taking right from here in Mary, we are founded in order to do good works. It's not talking about our works. 
It's talking about the founder making something of us. That's what she's talking about here. Because what just happened? She was made pregnant. Epi toi toi. Remember what Gabriel said to her? The Holy Spirit will overshadow you, will come upon, upon. What's the word? Epi, 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 epi. It means upon. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. He's going to found in her the body parts of her own Savior. See, Mary is not sinless. She needs a savior. Toi soterimu. Toi soterimu. Toi soterimu. See, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. So much for the Immaculate Mary idea. Epi toi teo. I see that. See how clever that is? That's why I'm telling, I'm betting money that she's using a ionic dative here. God is founding upon her. See, upon God. Her soul is, is, is founded. Well, that's true. God created us. God founded us in Christ. And Paul is picking right up from this to do Ephesians 2.10. And every scholar knows, it's even in Thayer's dictionary, that in Ephesians 2.10, it's, it's an ionic dative, which my own pastor exegeted and taught us. So hello, did they not notice it here? So you need the word founded. And who's doing the founding? God founded us on Christ. That's what Ephesians 2.10 says. That's what Mary's saying here. Her soul rejoices founded on God. Dative case, see, dative dative with epi. Ionic dative. With God doing the work. That's what Ephesians 2.10 says. It's not that we do works, which is how the translators translated it because they want to get credit because they're thinking like five-year-olds, even though they know it's an ionic dative in Ephesians 2.10. Yeah, but when you have an ionic dative, it means the person doing the founding is doing the work. The person doing the founding is building the city. The person doing the founding is funding the city. The person doing the founding is doing everything. And the recipient receives the benefit. Okay, what just happened here? This woman just got pregnant. Did she do it to herself? No. It was done to her. Epi toy toy. <laughs> Just like Gabriel said, he'll come upon you. Toy so terimu. Epi toy toy. Toy so terimu. She must have been laughing her head off when she said this. <coughs> And of course, at age 30, that's when he'll announce himself. Is she being clever or what? Okay, but this is not koine. This is ionic dative that Paul's going to repeat in Ephesians 2.10. Okay, that's why the word founded is there. Got that? Okay. Chotepeblepsin. You got that. Epitentapenosin. Now see, I didn't say epitentapenosin. Because look at the meter. Hotepeblepsin, epitentapenosin. See, da 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 da. Okay? Now, if I said hotepeblepsin, epitentapenosin, you could argue maybe that's how it ought to be too. But then you're, you're losing the stress on the root. So that's why I'm not going with it. But I can understand an argument going in the other direction. Hotepeblepsin. Hotepeblipsin, it's kind of harder to say. Everything tapenosin. It depends on how much they like a syncopated beat in Greek. I'm not sure. I haven't studied it enough. But I bet it was hotepeblipsin, everything tapenosin. Okay? Because if you said hotepeblipsin, everything tapenosin, you could do that too, I suppose. Hotepeblipsin, everything tapenosin. 
Ότι επιβλέψιν επί την ταπένωσιν. Ότι επέβλεψιν επί ταπένωσιν. Επί την ταπένωσιν. It just doesn't work to stress this. I'm sorry. But ότι επιβλέψιν επί την ταπένωσιν. You could do that. Ότι επιβλέψιν επί την ταπένωσιν. Επί την ταπένωσιν. Either way. So I'm arguing with myself and I'll move on. But this is epi and this is epi. You get that, right? So see, see, founded upon God, the ionic dative, okay? But this is epi with the, the accusative case. But it's still an epi. She's, play, she's playing epi to epi, see? On whose behalf or who's the founder? God, okay? And then here's the result. <clears throat> he sees... Her humiliation but but also you know if something's founded on God humiliation is going to result that's the cross all right it's an angelic trial that's it there's no way around that okay if you really believe in God you're going to be you're going to be humiliated knowing this information alone is humiliating I remember my pastor said that once you know people ask them or something you know well oh you're a pastor it's a, it's a big glory to you and he said, no, it's humiliating. And, and I look at this and I think, I shouldn't even be allowed to know this and live. I, I talk to God. I'm totally intimidated by what I tell you in videos. I'm like, why do I get to know this? I shouldn't be allowed to know this. I'm not good enough to know this. Well, yeah, that's why I have toy sorte anymore. I mean, Mary's not going to say she was good enough to be made pregnant with the Savior. And yeah, that resulted in her humiliation. You know, she's humiliated by this. This wrecked her life. Okay, but she was happy because she got to know him and she felt she shouldn't. This female saved. Now, <clears throat> that was the next thing I want to bring up. Epi toi teori. We covered that that's ionic dative. That Paul plays on in Philippians 1.20. I mean, well, not Philippians 1.20, he plays on this in Philippians 1.20. He plays on this in Ephesians 2.10. I'm just really shocked how much he plays on Mary, okay? All right, and that's a, this is, class, you know, plain old, ordinary, coin a, you know, with the accusative, right? This is, this is literally one thing standing on top of another, Okay. This has to do with epitoi epitoi has to do with purpose. And then the action. So here's the action. Humiliation. I mean, it is humiliating to build a building. It is humiliating to have a pregnancy. <clears throat> but you're glad of it. Okay, now this. All right. Your typical scholar is going to say to you, well, that's just a genitive case, modifying humiliation, saying whose humiliation it was. Yeah, but in classical Greek, you omitted prepositions, okay? And the reason you kept them out was because the same genitive could have a variety of meanings and you wanted them all to be referenced. So you didn't use a preposition to restrict the meaning. That's what she's doing here. See, because that you could say by means of. <clears throat> by means of. See, it's genitive case, but 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 preposition in takes the genitive case. By means of. Inside. Inside. Why? Because she's pregnant. Inside his female slave. The humiliation inside. Yeah, and it's humiliation in two senses. It's humiliating to be pregnant because your body changes and you feel ugly all the time. But the bigger humiliation is what he's going to experience once he's born. He regarded the humiliation, and yeah, this is tes dules. Okay, but the Lord has agreed if. Isaiah 53.10 to be the Asham offering. That's the word used there in Isaiah 53.10, Asham. Okay, it's red heifer. It's a female word. So she's playing on what's inside her 
who she's a female, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that female heifer, red heifer, offering, asham. See this Hebraism. Isaiah 53.10. Using classical Greek case endings rather than preposition. See, it, if you think of it solely as coining, all you're going to see is that this clause modifies this clause. Yeah, it does. But if you think with a wider brain, considering how the New Testament uses words, then you say, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, this is double entendre here. Oh, double entendre, see, in, in, in classical Greek, you didn't use prepositions. And then you just use case endings so that everybody could match up all kinds of different prepositions that took those case endings and get a lot more meaning out of your words. Yeah. The red heifer offering. See, the heifer is full of the body parts developing for the red heifer offering by means of his slave. Inside, Greek preposition N takes the genitive. See the wordplay she's using? And what is that? That's classical Greek. And that's a Hebraism playing on Isaiah 53.10. See, when you look at the Greek, you understand how, how, they, how the words are constructed. This is, it's not even possible that these words are not God's words. The Holy Spirit had to be filling her to give her this much cleverness just on the fly like that. She has to be filled with the Holy Spirit to do this. It's far more sophisticated than she's getting credit for. And I'm not saying that because she's a woman. I could care less about that. All the Bible writers are using this kind of sophistication. And we don't pay any attention to it. See what we're missing? We've gone from, we've gone from ionic dative, okay, to, to you know, the, the result of the ionic dative, but it's a koine construction, epitentapenosin, or tapenosin, which I think is better. Tapenas, no, I'm wrong. It's tapenosin. All right. Tej dules autu. Tej dules autu. Tej dules autu. Tej, tej, tej dules. See, see, see. Genitives. Asham offering, female red heifer offering for the whole nation of Israel. Im tasim asham nafsho. Isaiah 53, 10 in my bad Hebrew. Tesh, 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 genitive, genitive, genitive. Preposition, N. And there are other prepositions like dia, <coughs> through, N and dia both can have the connotation of conduit or means. Yeah, the humiliation on the cross is our means of salvation. You get the word play. Okay. Am I sounding like a harpy? Okay. Well, that's really straightforward. Okay, idu is taken from place, classical Greek. Oh, fuck, I have to deal with it. Okay, phone call over. Now, let's see, where were we? Ah, uh, yeah, there's we were. We are recording. Okay, we were at Idu Garaputunun. Okay, well, Idu is classical Greek. It, see, it carried over into Koine. Because it was said a lot of times in the poems, in all Greek writ literature, sacred literature and otherwise. Okay? That's a, that's a dramatic phrase. Well, dramatic term. Look! Alert! That's how my pastor likes to translate it, because he was a big military guy. Look here! Look! A great English translation of that. I had to say look at this to get the meter to match. You know, to get the syllable count. From now on, apple tunum. Apple means out from the source of. Okay? Um... Case genitive, it's very straightforward, quite a, almost any kind of Greek, really. Okay. 
Maar kan je ook niet pas zien? Zie je de kinds? Alright, that's why I know I got the I got the illusions right. Cause after I after I do the illusions, I I check it for cadence. Makarios me pas yeni. That's how she, that's how you would have said it. All right, makarios me. Now see, there's a scene here, so if you want to say makarios me, but that's not right because it's makarios. So okay, makarios or makarios. Makarios in by Sigani, but I think it's Makarios in me. Not why she's paying some kind of attention to the penultimate, because this is in clinic. Okay? Makarios in me by Sigani. You're not going to say, hey, 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 hey. Pasai should be I. Sorry. I said it wrong. Makarios in me by Sigani. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a g GH sound. G, g, it's not a hard G. Okay. Makarios in me pa si henni. It's a g. Alright. Pa si henni. Sorry, I did it wrong. Try it again. Makarios in me. Makarios in me. Probably is even better. Makarios in me. Pa si henni. Okay, and I should have up, made my voice up at the top of my palate there. I'll have to learn how to do that. Like I said, I'm I'm bad on my Mandarin tone, so I gotta practice those. Okay. Now, see this. That is nominative. But it's got a sound that plays circular. And of course, the word generation is Hebrew door. And she's thinking of that. And this too is a quotation from the Old Testament, many Old Testament verses, especially in the Psalms. Okay, from generation to generation, Melam Adolam. And 63 syllables, hello, is the first place that Psalm 90, verses 1 through 3, are divisible by 7. And that is what? Psalm 91 through 3 covers. See, she's invoking the verse when she just uses the word generations. And of course, he's blessing God in those verses. See, it's almost impossible, see, especially since she's using the meter, it's impossible not to know what verse she's got in mind when she says this. So she's not bragging about herself. It has a very different meaning. She's fitting herself in the historical context. And this means makarios means happiness. Makarios in me pa saiken. Makarios in me. I have to rehearse that. Makarios in me pa saiken. All generations. Theme of Psalm 90 verses 1 through 3. All generations are, are pregnant in God. She's fitting herself into the historical context. That's why she's using 63. 63 also means vote short. But that's how Moses datelined 63 sevens from the, from the slavery in Egypt. I go through that math in the um, 11 GGS videos and in the Psalm 90 videos. Okay? So this is a Hebraism. See why? Okay. What the poison moe megala hodunatos. What the poison moe megala hodunatos. Okay, now here, and you can't see it in English. Yes, this means great things. Greek koine didn't have a superlative. Peter invents one called megistas. Megistas. And uh, I forget if it's first or second Peter. I think it's first Peter. Great and precious promises in English. He invents the word magistas, but there really was no word like that in Koine Greek. And as far as I know, it wasn't really Attic either. I have to look it up. But she's placing Megala next to Hodunatos, the Almighty. See, great things, the Almighty. She's she's 
I mean, this is proper word order in Greek. You're supposed to put the, the uh, if you, you, you don't have to follow this word order, but the normal word order is to put the object after the verb. Okay? And a lot of times they don't do that to stress the object. But she wants to stress that God is great, so she's sticking that here, especially since there's no superlative. Okay? And because she has to say great thing, you know, the gala, the ah there. See? Plural. Neuter. All right, but she's sticking it right next to the Almighty on purpose. That's another Hebraism. It might not be only a Hebraism because I would think that the the Greeks, even with their polytheism, would have done something like this. All right. Okay. Kaharion tonu mamu. Kaharion. Okay, this Kai, there are lots of different names for it that the scholars assign, and the names kind of confuse me sometimes. They call it emphatic, or they call it ascensive, or they call it this or that, or ep epexegetical. Okay, this is emphatic. That's why I translated it definitely. This is the translation for Kai there. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Okay, I needed the extra syllables to make it eight. There is no holy is his name. It's holy, comma, his name. When you do this, that's another Greek drama thing. She's dropping verbs. This is an Atticism. And they did it in Koine also. Hagion, Hagias. You're going to keep the stress right here so that everybody knows what word you're saying. Kai. Even. That's how a lot of people would translate that. But definitely in English is better. Or in fact. But in fact sounds too cold in English. Definitely isn't much better. If you've got a better translation than definitely that's got as many syllables, let me know. Okay? Alright. Kai to Okay, this too is emphatic. Here I used even to, to, to say that. She's equating holiness and mercy. Only it's not mercy. Eleos means loving kindness. It's the translation of Hebrew chesed. So the Hebraism. Okay, so this chi and this chi are in parallel. She's equating. Typical Hebrew couplet style. Toileo shatu. Kai toileo shatu. Okay? Notice I said eleos. Okay? It's not eleos. Could be eleos. That's probably even. Kai toileo shatu. That could be. That could be. I take it back. Kai toileo shatu. But this is supposed to just be smooth breathing. And that the it's it's up high, and that would have the effect of the stress. But Eleos is probably better. I have to think that over. But there's another emphatic chi right here. So I translated it even because I didn't need four syllables. Definitely, I didn't need four syllables down here. But it's the same kind of usage. Okay. Ace. I gotta learn how to say that properly. Iskeneas Kaigeneas. Okay, and it literally means from generation to generation, but in English I had to just say from and to because I only had eight syllables to work with. Alright, this is, you know, this is classical Greek, also um, Koine. There's no, you know, nothing special about it, really. Except that this is a Hebraistic expression for me olam madolam, so you call that Hebraism also. Okay. Tois fogumenois auto. Tois fogumenois auto. Okay. And fobeo is the word here, is a participle. She drops verbs and turns them into a participle. That is attic, that's an atticism. 
when you're excited or you want to be dramatic what you do is you drop prepositions you drop verbs you change them into participles or other kinds of nouns verbal nouns you want to use just nouns okay that's supposed to be more dramatic okay so this is an atticism and phobao means to revere or to be in awe of or to fear negative sense of fear it's got all that semantic range okay to those fearing him is how most people will translate it but that's not good enough to those revering him to those in awe of him revering is better here because it it shows the participle meaning here and some of that usage you know with the participle switching from verb we do that in English too alright Okay, brachion, arm. Notice how I'm lighting the E at the end. Okay, this is a Hebraism. This, all the words arm in the Old Testament, she's invoking all of those. Okay, she's specifically thinking of Haggai too, which I'll have to get to in a later video. This whole section here is about Haggai too. Alright. Epoes and Gratos. Literally, Epoeo. Um, this, is, this is the past, Arist. Um it means to make or to do it's it's an auxiliary verb that we all use It's not necessarily used as an auxiliary verb in Greek but it, it has some of that meaning um, so it would be literally to make rule kratos means to rule have dominion over have power over have authority over so that's why I translated it exerts authority and then and means by means of as well as inside you know in location but here she's talking about by means of so by, and I think most translations use it as by. Okay, so this you could argue, well, you know, that's that's quite a, but it's got more classical because of the way she's saying it. Okay, but it's a Hebraism because of the fact that she's using arm. And like I said, as we'll see in later videos, she's she's evoking uh, Haggai too. Okay. The scorpion who perifranos. The scorpion who perifranos. I keep putting an, an R sound in fanus. I don't know why I do that. It's wrong. I'm wrong when I do that. The scorpion who perifranos. All right. This is a direct quote from Daniel. And it's also a direct quote from Haggai 2. I'm going to have to cover that later. All right. When it says he's putting to flight those of haughty mind, that's how I translate. See, this is this is those thinking highly of themselves. And this literally means to scatter. All right, but it means to put to flight. Like it, it's the scattering that it, that it means the most is military scattering when you have routed the enemy and they're running off in all directions they are not making an orderly retreat they're panicked and Daniel uses this particular phrase at least it's translated that way in the LXX um, finals, all right. so this, this got a classical Greek concept to it because of the way she's phrasing it okay okay and this is definitely classical Greek, all right. And that's why I have to I have to cover it. She's using the dative again. Remember, she used this is really clever. Remember, I said this was the ep, I bet money. This is the ionic dative, and that's why I'm using the word founded up here. And and Paul is playing on that in Ephesians 10, which everybody knows is an ionic dative. In Ephesians 10, the scholars know that Paul is using ionic dative because Paul is basing his whole book of Ephesians on the play Ion by Euripides which is about the Ion means the venom snake venom it's a euphemism for semen and it was a play about the founding of the Greeks 
And what Paul is wryly doing throughout the book of Ephesians is showing the Greeks to whom he's writing, Hi, you thought you were founded on a snake, because that's what the play Ion is about. But instead, you're founded on the real God. So when he gets to Ephesians 2.10, he's using the Ionic data, which everybody reading his letter would get. And all the, you know, the scholars get that too. All right, well, Mary's using it here. You got that. All right, so down here, we have a little parallel. See, they're founding themselves. I couldn't put the word founded in here. I'd say by means of. She drops prepositions because it's dramatic. And she's using only the dative. Okay? And then she got, she's, well, oh, wait, the dative is right here. And then, cardia shouton. All right? Genitive. Yeah, they were found, they were, they were, you know, they were thinking too highly of themselves. Paul will pick up on this in Romans 12. <clears throat> 12, 1 through 3. By means of, they were, they were promoting themselves by means of what? Their own thinking in their hearts. They were founding their high opinion of themselves by means of their own thinking in their hearts. See, they were founding, Ionic dated again, with no epi, because there's no foundation. Got that? In this cute, there's no foundation for them to think so highly of themselves, but they're using an epic. They're, they're leaving out the epi because there's no foundation. By means of their own thinking rather than by means of the rock. In their own hearts, they're thinking highly of themselves. Yeah, and he puts them to flight. So she switched straight back to the ionic date of usage, but left out. Left out. Ha ha. No more. No epi. There's nothing that they're founded on, see? There's no epi toi teoi for their dianoi. They're just, it's empty. Hmm? So that's why you want to translate this not in their hearts, but by means of. And that is how God puts everybody to flight. You got, you either got God's ideas in your head or you got your ideas in your head. And if they're your ideas, honey, then you're building on sand. And by means of your own thinking, you're going to have a downfall. That's what she's talking about here. And how many verses in the Old Testament do you think she's referencing? A bazillion of them. Because what is that? This is a major theme of the Old Testament. And specifically, Daniel and Haggai 2. Okay, because this is a direct quote from Haggai 2 right here. Haggai 2, 22 in particular. All right, see, God tells, God tells Zerubbabel, Mary's ancestor, and Joshua, Elizabeth's ancestor, that he's going to shake the heavens and the earth and overturn the powers and the principalities and the thrones. Okay, that's what he tells them. And he spends a lot of time repeating himself. He even comes there twice on the same day. Hanukkah. So she's so excited about recognizing that she drops the preposition here and she's using classical, classical, classical Greek case ending to say by means of, which is what, you know, all the verses in the Old Testament say, you know, like Psalm 37. Don't get all upset about the guy who seems to be having a good time now. He will not prosper in the end because by means of his own thinking, he's going to go down. Don't emulate him. That's the sort of theme of Psalm 37. Okay? And then this is another Hebraism because she's quoting the LXX and she's changing Haggai 2.22. She's changing that word. She's making it milder. He lowers, lowers, lowers. You know, okay, well, it's your, you've had your time on stage. Now it's time for you to get down from the throne. And, of course, when she's saying this, she's covering the very time period that's about 17 years prior to her son's birth when all that throne lowering took place. I covered that, or I, I, yeah, you should have heard that. We covered that history already by the time you hear this video. Katelin, dunastas apotronon. 
Let me start back up here because I stopped reading it. A poison gratos in brachion auto. A poison gratos in brachion auto. The scorpis and huperefanus. The annoyai. Cardias auto. See the cadence? Even with my bad pronunciation, you can see the cadence. Catelen dunastas apotronum. Catelen dunastas apotronum. See how it's it's got that beat to it? So it'll be easy to remember. It's much prettier than English. Okay. Kahupsosen tapenus. Now, I don't think you should be saying tapenus, although it sounds good for the dramatic effect here. Okay? It should be kahupsosen tapenus. Because tapeno is, is being, you know, referenced here. Kahupsos and tapenus. But you could say, Kahupsos and tapenus. I mean, the reader would get that because tapeno is not an easily confused verb. And so uh, maybe what you want to do is you want to stress the fact that it's a plural object because that's what that means, the usending. So you could probably pronounce it either way. But you see how this is working? E poison kratos in brachion autu. Te scorpis en huperefanus. Te anoiai, cardias auton. Catelen dunastas apotronon. Or catelen dunastas apotronon. Depending on if you want to stress apo. It doesn't change the number of syllables, it's just how, how you want to say it. Cahupsos en tapenus. Cahupsos en tapenus. You know, decide how you want to say it. I, both of them could be argued. Okay, and then down here, see, you'll, you'll notice here, and here, and here, she's, she's stressing noun forms, all right, that's drama, that's, that's Greek drama, these are Attic flavored, I don't know if you really call them Atticisms, but they're Attic flavored, and of course here, there's a preposition, I mean a, a participle. Penontas, those hungry. Oh no, it's not a it's not a parcel, I'm sorry. Penontas. And a plesen. Agaton. Penontas and a plesen. Agaton. See, agatas. So you're not going to stress the syllable. Penontas and a plesen. Notice I'm stressing it here. Because it's it's plural, all right. Penontas and a place in that penontas and a place in agaton. Agaton. Penontas and a place in agaton. Penontas and a place in agaton. Penontas and a place in agaton. You could do it that way, I suppose. Da 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 da. Of course, it depends on if she wanted to syncopate it. Okay, then kai plutuntas exapistelen genus. Now here, genus has the effect of emphasizing the emptiness. So I think she might have used it that way to stress it, but maybe not. Okay, and it's exapistelen. It's not ex 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 That would you can miss out what this verb is. It's apostello. So it's ex apostelin. Caiplonuntas ex apostelin genus. Caiplutontas plutuntas caiplutuntas ex apostelin genus. Probably that has the best cadence. Unless she wants to syncopate it. Apistelin. Okay. And that's just straightforward. There's nothing there's nothing particular about that except that she's quoting scripture here. Lots of scripture. Actually she's been quoting scripture ever since the beginning here. Most of this is all centered on the themes of Haggai too. These are all everything that you're seeing here is covered in Haggai 2. All that. 
the themes of Haggai 2 are about hunger. You were hungry before, and from this day on, you know, you're going to be filled. So she's, she's literally saying that Haggai 2 is going to be fulfilled there. She's invoking it. That's why you can't. This, this is Hanukkah, especially since the, day, the year her son is born is the 160th anniversary of Hanukkah. See, she keyed it to this. Duh! Okay. That's, that's part of what God talks about there. Is that you were empty and now I'm going to fill you. Yes, you fill pregnancy, you get the plan. Okay. And then, how, how did people miss this? I could just kill myself. Ante la beto Israel padusautu. Ante la beto Israel padusautu. Ante la beto Israel padusautu. Okay. That's lambano. Ante lambano is the word, word there. Okay, so you could say ante la beto. Israel by those out to probably until I bet Israel by those out to you can play with that okay see this that's what it really means until I until I lambano which I covered before it does mean to help but it's this particular kind of help where you exchange one thing for something else Spe specifically ransom all right you're helping because you're ransoming something somebody else needs. And ransom is a major thing in the Old Testament, okay? Well, what does it say in Haggai 2? That Zerubbabel is going to be the signet ring. Now, the last time we saw a signet ring, God took his signet ring away from who? Jeconiah. And he puts, he, he takes it from Jack and I and he gives it to Zerubbabel. You know what that means. Is that the loins of Zerubbabel are going to be the progenitor of Messiah. That's what the signet ring meant. You gave your signet ring to the heir. So you're king and you're dying. You take off your ring and you give it to the heir. And the signet ring means it's the thing that you use to push in the hot wax to sign decrees and stuff like that. All right. So that's Haggai too. Well, God is exchanging his signet ring from Jeconiah to Zerubbabel. So why is it we don't know the Lord was born on Hanukkah? How come we're so incompetent that for 2,000 years we don't know this? I mean, her whole theme, see, 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 160th anniversary of Hanukkah, he's going to be born. Yeah, she's filled with the body parts. Yeah, and he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth, just like John. Duh! See how clever this is? So he's exchanging his life. See, that's Isaiah 5310 again. See, we saw that before up here. The play on the classical Greek usage of, of, of case endings rather than preposition. That's the Asham offering, that's the F5310. And so she's invoking it again down here because that's exactly what Isaiah 5310 is about. If you will exchange your soul as a substitute for sin. That's Isaiah 5310 in my badly pronounced Hebrew. Israel He returns to exchange for Israel his child. All right? That, you could just say, well, okay, that's, you know, straightforward Greek, doesn't, you know, nothing particular about it, except that he's, she's invoking scripture, namely Haggai 2, namely the signet ring passage, when God exchanged his signet ring from Jeconiah to Zerubbabel, her ancestor, listed in both of the genealogies of Matthew and Luke, which we haven't covered the Luke genealogy yet. Hello. Could we not know? How can we not know when the Lord was born on Hanukkah? How can we not know that? Because we didn't look. So much for our vaunted scholarship. Okay. Zechariah means remember, and that's what this Greek verb means. Remember, to remember, to recall, to remember. 
Leos again is Chesed in, in Hebrew. So you have to call this and this a Hebraistic use of the Greek. I mean, grammatically, it's, you know, pretty straightforward. Alright. Nesht and Leos. But you can understand why it would have this cadence. See, you got, look, 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 look. Got the poise and Kratos and Brachio now, too. This is where she starts to quote Haggai too extensively. Okay? Ti scorpis and Hoperefanus. Ti annoia, cardia, sauton. Catelen dunasas apotrono. That's a direct quote of uh, Haggai 2.22. Cahupsos and Taipenus. Penontas. And a place in Agaton. She's still quoting from Haggai too. Kai Plutontas exapistel and Genus. Still quoting from Haggai too. Until about to Israel Paidos Auto. That's the signet ring verse in Haggai 22. Haggai 2. Nesh the Neleos. Okay? That's a generic statement of God remembers, and that's what Zacharias means. Yah means God. Zakar means to recall. And she's talking to Elizabeth, the wife of Zechariah. Ha ha. Could this be cuter? Then here, Katos elelees and prastus pateras genon. That's pretty straightforward. Katos elelees and, or you could say, Katos elelees I don't think it's that's proper. Well, it's Lego, so, you know, Lego changes, so you might be able to get away with that. Katos elelees and prastus pateras genon. And it is pateras. Everybody stresses that so long. Katos elalis and prastus pateras chemon. Just as he testified face to face with our fathers. Pras means face to face with. It comes from, it's a shortened version of prasopon, which means face. Alright? And then, toy Abraham kaito spermati auto. I think this should be said spermati, but she's. If, if it's excellent there, it's sperma, so I'm wrong. Toy Abraham, kaito sperma ti autu. Toy Abraham, kaito sperma ti autu. Toy Abraham, kaito sperma ti autu. To Abraham, even also to his singular seed, and Paul quotes this in Galatians 3. And then here's our next Hebraism. I Ayona, Adolam in Hebrew. Ace, I'm saying it wrong. Ace, Ton, Ayona. Ace, Ton, Ayona. Okay? So this whole second paragraph. Epois, Kratos, and Brachion, Atu. The Scorpis, and The Anoia, Hardia, Sauton. Catel, and Dunasas, Apotrono. Cahupsos, and Tapinus. Penontas and a place in Agaton. Cai Plutuntas exapestel and genus. Ante laveto Israel padus autu. Menest in Eleus. Catos elalis and pras tus pateras gemum. Toy Abraham, caito spermati autu. Es ton Iona. Thank mm -hmm. you.